Hello everyone. Thank you for your patience and welcome to the webinar titled Integrating Oracle Argus Safety with Clinical Systems Using Argus Interchange's EDB Functionality presented by Biofarms Dr. Rodney Lemery, Vice President of Safety and Pharmacovigilance. I'm Eugene Sapanoff, the Marketing Manager at Biofarm, and I will be going over some housekeeping items before I turn it over to Rodney. During the presentation, all participants will be in listen-only mode. However, you may submit questions to the speaker at any time today by typing them in the chat feature located on the left side of your screen. Please state your questions clearly, and keep in mind other webinar participants will not see your questions or comments. Nonetheless, your questions to the speaker will be addressed as time allows towards the end of the presentation. If you still have unanswered questions after the webinar or would like to request information from Biofarm, feel free to visit the company's website for contact information. As a reminder, today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Biofarm's website within 24 hours. We will also be emailing you a link to the recording and a PDF version of the presentation. This concludes our housekeeping items. I would now like to turn the call over to Rodney. Hi, good morning everyone, or afternoon depending on where you are. Um, thank you for joining us. And today I really just want to cover a, a very interesting project that we have been involved in where we utilize the electronic submissions module of Argus Safety to integrate um, to a particular company's clinical system where they store both post-marketed and uh, uh, sponsored clinical trial data. Sorry. So I just want to cover the various stages of the project that we have worked on. Um, the project initiation, how we identified key stakeholders, what the system design actually entailed, and look at the anticipated timeline and uh, talk about some of the um, actuals that we encountered. I want to then look at the specific development opportunities that we saw in this particular project, the implementation strategy, and most probably importantly, and of most interest to many of you is definitely the challenges that we faced in utilizing the ESM extended E2B attributes uh, to perform this type of integration work. So in the realm of health information systems, many articles and literature pieces are available uh, out there, and one particular textbook on health information systems implementation by O'Carroll and others <clears throat> insists that the key stakeholder identification is really a key piece of the project success. And in the work that I'm quoting here and that you have in the reference slide at the end of this uh, presentation, there are two broad uh, key players identified by O'Carroll and his team of other authors. The first is the IT view, and the second is the business view. And this identification of key stakeholder and understanding the perspectives of these two main players is proven to be uh, key in the successful implementation of any health information system. And obviously, I am using the umbrella of health information system uh, largely uh, so that it encompasses the pharmacovigilance and uh, signal detection type software, which I would argue is, in fact, an extension of health information. So again, O'Carroll and his uh, co-authors identify the IT view and the business view. And some now, after having many discussions with various people in our uh, industry, have argued or suggested that because our field of uh, pharmacovigilance and safety has a very strong regulatory focus and uh, 
regulatory aspect to its work, that the QA view may actually be a third key stakeholder that is important in these types of system implementations. Um, other people that I have spoken with would argue that the QA view actually is embedded in either or both the IT and the business view in most implementations. And so a formal rep, uh, realization that there are three is probably not necessary. But in any case, the identification of the stakeholders in a project is definitely key to a successful implementation. So some examples of what we encountered as IT needs are uh, things of uh, specific to integration work. Do we need direct database connectivity? How is this integration going to be facilitated? Are we going to use web services? Um, what's the physical architecture that is being used? And the key piece for, for these types of integrations, especially clinical integration to, to safety, is what is the unique case ID that is going to need to be generated by our integration process so that we can clearly identify initial cases versus follow-up to previously uh, imported cases. We also had to tackle from an IT perspective whether or not the integration should be unidirectional or bidirectional between the systems. So these types of perspectives are, are quite important in determining an appropriate solution for your integration methods. And I think at this point it's probably a good place to mention that while this presentation focuses solely on the integration of a clinical system to the safety pharmacovigilance system, these principles are much larger than that and they could apply to any type of integration, whether it be a call center application uh, to the Argus safety system or uh, a completely different system integrated to, to another. The system design for this type of implementation, the specific one that we are talking about as an example, was quite uh, large. And the design is, is a bit complicated. And here I'm showing you, and I don't expect you to be able to read this slide, but as Eugene said, you're going to get copies of these in PDF form and you can zoom in so that it is uh, uh, more readily le legible on your desktop. But this just goes to show you the pieces of the system that needed to be in place in order for us to accomplish this type of large-scale uh, integration. So here, I'll just walk you briefly through it. We had the two source systems. These were both uh, different, um, essentially electronic data capture tools. We needed to port that data into a staging area, conform the information into some type of standard. Uh, this was required because the source systems have the flexibility of creating very similar information in completely different manners. So there needed to be some anchor to get the information in a conformed format so that then the programmers could identify logic that was reproducible logic to generate the source XML files that were needed by the E2B bridging uh, mechanism, part of the Oracle Argus solution by default, also known as Interchange or Electronic Submission Module, ESM. So once the files were conformed, we could then programmatically generate the XML and then from that point forward we use the standard ESM technology to import and uh, process the actual case data, again, originating from the source systems. In this particular uh, mechanism there was a, a secondary integration 
which was to the back end, and this particular company needed to get the modified Argus information back out of the system and into a final destination application so that they could perform the finite regulatory reporting from the target system. So the, in this particular integration effort, what you will see is Argus is being used as an intermediary holder for the <clears throat> safety data so that it can be properly uh, reviewed, analyzed, and responded to in a timely manner. And then finally, the record of uh, submission is stored in a completely separate system, and thus this tail end integration that you see here. So again, we had to answer some very uh, specific IT questions. So how were we going to accomplish this integration in, in, in actuality? So here we used a combination of basic database table manipulation in the Life Science Hub uh, system. And that then, in turn, allowed us to generate the E2B plus the extended E2B or ESM uh, XML file. And then that was moved via web services from the LSH environment into the appropriate Argus interchange folders. So in this example, the integration is unidirectional only, meaning the source systems of OLX and OCRDC were considered the source by this particular client, and therefore um, nothing manipulated from the Argus application was ever sent back to the source system. So those are some uh, of the IT perspectives that we encountered on this uh, project. Some of the interesting business uh, perspectives or the business views that we encountered were uh, how frequently should this transfer happen. Um, there was real concern that they needed it to be very timely um, if a SAE or um, clinical event in OCRDC or OLX occurred and was time sensitive. They didn't want to wait, a, you know, 48 hours, 24 hours, what, whatever the quote typical um, process time would be for a, a typical integration. So we needed to map out. How frequently should this work? How, how often should it be manual? Should it be automated, et cetera? We also have the added interesting business perspective of what data should come across from the clinical system. As, as many of you who work in this space know, uh, especially if you're dealing with sick patient populations, you can encounter on sponsored trials hundreds upon hundreds of laboratory values, sometimes hundreds upon hundreds of concomitant therapies, prior therapies, or prior medical histories, many of which are not at all related to particular events that may occur on that patient while in your sponsored trial. So how does one decide how much of that data to pull over? Um, this is definitely one of the key business needs where the involvement of the business view was, I would argue, hypercritical. Also, it is important in these integration efforts to clearly identify the event definition. So what should trigger the movement of one of these cases from the source system into the Argus application via this integration? Should it be all of the adverse event data? Should, what about product complaint data? What if a, a medical information or a registry information is captured in the OLX or OCRDC environment? Essentially what we're asking here is what should constitute a case in the source system that ultimately ends up in the, the safety environment. So this, this construct of what is a case and how should it come across is uh, quite important from the business perspective. So again, 
for this particular project, um, when should the data be triggered? We, we had to iron out exact data movements. Um, so here, for example, when should the information move from OLX to RDC into the staging area of LSH? When should the transformation of that data uh, occur? And the transformation that we utilized was moving it from the source OLX OCRDC format into the SDTM standard. And again, the reason we are doing that is because the source systems were so varied in their study definition that, um, for example, gender may not have been gender in all of the studies. In one study, it may have been a variable called gender. In, one, in another study, it may have been sex. So it's um, obviously difficult to program a standard routine reusable program when the data is not conformed to some type of, of standard. So uh, that transformation of the source information was chosen to be into the SDTN standard. Once that SDTN standard was applied uh, to the OLX OCRDC data in LSH, then we needed to programmatically generate standard E2B plus files from LSH and queue them up for transfer over to the uh, Argus Interchange server so that Argus would know that a new file was present and uh, would import that in through the E2B pending screen. <clears throat> Some of our QA needs. Um, I am going to cover those since this is uh, our industry and it's important to all of us. Um, this was probably seen by most of our clients and certainly by us internally as custom development work. And definitely normally in a uh, risk-based approach to validation would probably be seen as anywhere from medium to high. In, in its effort. Um, and this would mean that there should be some type of significant development uh, and uh, testing approach. And for our team that worked on this project, we uh, all utilized a standard FDA regulatory type testing strategy. So we used the FDA definitions of IQ which is the installation qualification, OQ, or operational qualification, and PQ, which is performance qualification, to formally validate the, the application, the custom application. And when I say the custom application or system, I mean everything from source through to final uh, XML import into Argus. So in the IQ phase, this dealt with all of the installation activities, including all of the documentation and any rudimentary testing that was performed. This uh, happened to be things like unit testing, um, peer code reviews, those types of things, um, all the way through to the actual application of the web services and the programmatic programs that were needed in the various transformations and uh, transfers of the files. The OQ, or operational qualification, was driven off of functional requirements that uh, were used to develop this application. And then uh, standard testing was used to just look at basic functionality. So uh, things like um, if a serious case is created in the system, in the source system, does it uh, generate a uh, transformed XML file in LSH? And does that XML file get picked up and moved into the Argus folder appropriately? And then finally, we involved user community for user testing or PQ testing as well. The timeline, uh, this is a very large project. It, it cascaded uh, over two-year period, and that was for all integration periods, uh, all integration points, rather. And, uh, you know, the timeline's important. It controls your costs. Um, it affects your user expectations. So um, 
certainly not perfect. Um, many times these projects uh, bump out due to unforeseen circumstances that may arise, um, sometimes due to things you do know that are coming. So uh, as, as you've all probably experienced, uh, the timeline has to uh, be monitored and uh, project managers need to have the flexibility to adjust the schedule as as needed. Um, and in our experience, it was mostly the um, partnership with the, the client side project manager and the communication efforts between both PMs that uh, assisted us in making sure that the, the timelines were applied, hopefully kept on track, and um, if it did slip, it slipped with everyone knowing uh, fully exactly what happened and why and what we might be able to do better. So in the development and testing phase, uh, one of the important key aspects that had to occur here was the mapping. And this mapping was very uh, challenging. Um, there were a number of source fields that really had no home in the E2B file uh, structure. As, as all of you know, the E2B standard without doing an extended E2B is, is fairly limited. There, there's only a, a, a finite number of fields and tags that you have available to you. Um, coupled with this complexity is the fact that even in the E2B plus or extended E2B elements of Argus, you are still limited to a lot of the uh, extension possibilities. The biggest limit, and we will talk about this in the challenge area, is that you are limited to only child tags. You cannot create new parent tags. So this mapping effort was really critical hyper important and really required everyone involved to fully understand the limits of the system and the available E2B files. This again is an example of one of those mapping specs that we uh, needed to generate. And uh, this allowed us to take the tag from the E2B standard take the source conformed SDTM data. Remember, everything at this point will have been conformed to SDTM. And map those pieces of data to one another. Um, this may have required us to create lookups into the decode values of the E2B table from Argus. <coughs> but it, in fact, um, has the option of doing very simplistic mapping and more complicated or convoluted logic as well. So we had also issues where the source system had multiple records that needed to come over to a single E2B field. We had the opposite where single uh, records in the E2B were, were present in multiple records in the source system, so we needed to accommodate the flexibility of this tool to do things like where clause, um, max lengths. We had to make sure that we adhered to the maximum lengths across all of the, the applications being used, source and target. Uh, we tried to leverage the default E2B tags whenever possible because that really rapidly, uh, it allowed us to rapidly deploy. Each time you create a new E2B tag, um, there's an, uh, a bit of work that needs to be done, and I'm going to cover what exactly you have to do in a moment. But needless to say, the complexity of adding the new E2B tags, really we wanted to minimize uh, how often we, we needed to do that. That was a conscious effort to try and co control for implementation time and cost. And this was really a, a key um, and interesting uh, struggle that you will see in all of your health information systems implementations which is that teeter-totter kind of uh, push and pull between the IT view and the business view. 
of course, um, in, a, in a perfect business world, as a business user, if I pretend to be a business user, I want all my data from the source into my safety system so that I don't have to go back into my source to do any type of verification. I can just look at all of my data within the safety world or space. And then in the IT view, I don't want to overburden the system maintenance costs. I don't want to create an, a, a dependency on external vendors. Uh, there, there are some very uh, important IT pieces that, that need to be balanced with the requests from the business world. And I would say that uh, uh, that is a, always an interesting uh, struggle in all of these projects. Many times we ended up having to surface user-defined fields uh, from the Argus system so that we could accommodate these extended pieces of data. Um, we had to configure the products and studies appropriately, sometimes uh, deciding whether or not to trick the Argus system um, based on some limitations of the E2B file and its uh, association to clinical trials or studies and how that data appears in the XML file. And then, of course, we enabled the interchange and AG services uh, configurations in order to get uh, just the basic E2B functionality working. So many times the code lists were very much challenging. Um, it was very challenging to try and map, for example, free text source code in the source system to predefined uh, code lists inside of Argus. This was uh, a definite um, technical struggle for us. Uh, so how how do we deal with, in this case, the other specify. Um, if the business wanted that information in the race field, how were we going to map free-floating text fields into uh, essentially predetermined list of values in the Argus system? And even if we did define, and we did define a methodology to do that, we needed to make sure that there was a clear error handling process in place so that if something was in the source system when it was not present in the target or Argus, we needed to make sure that someone was made aware of that so that one of two things happen. Either the source system needs to be updated to conform, or most of the time, Argus needs to be configured with that uh, source system option. And then how are you going to deal with future updates to this? this um, these code lists are living and breathing and they, in, in, in the clinical space, change sometimes between studies. So it becomes a bit of a uh, maintenance nightmare. So studies, definite limitations on the E2B importing mechanism of not just Argus, but all safety applications. It is it mostly due to an E2B limitation. It, it doesn't really have anything to do with your safety system. Um, so if the studies are created and configured within the Argus application, then the data coming from the source system will behave in a particular way in the E2B importing, and this could, in fact, uh, uh, manifest as uh, duplicate records of when, when you don't intend them to have them. You also have the added uh, complexity, and this is a, a large organization, so they have a very complex product repository. Um, the product names have to match the, the trade names. So we are finding ourselves struggling in the IT space to define a methodology so that products that are defined in the clinical space, the sponsored trial space of OCRDC, OLX, find their way and are properly populated within the product repository of the company. So these are, these are definite uh, development issues that we needed to address. We 
also identified a, a number of extended E2B elements that we needed to accommodate. And these uh, extended tags have a particular methodology you have to follow in order to get them into the system. <clears throat> and I've outlined that methodology here. So for example, the, the first thing you do is create a custom uh, DTD profile using in the ESM tool itself. So we're going to go in and just create a new profile, usually copying it from an existing profile that comes with the interchange application. You then are going to load the, the intended extended tags into the CFG E2B and LM ESM Argus mapping tables. Once they are in those tables, and that has to be done through the database uh, directly, there's no tool to do that. Once that they are in those two tables, then you can use the DTD um, E2B ESM mapping tool to manipulate that information further. And that is where you would use that tool to develop any type of custom import and export programming for each of the uh, extended tags. Um, most of the time, the export code for these tags are defined at the parent level and not at every single child level. But the import code, conversely, are defined per tag and are not found at the parent level in general. Here is an example of how we had to add tags to the DTD profile, and the location has to match the order of the E2B file itself. So here, for example, is the patient race extension tag. We had to make sure that it was present in two places, and again, the order needed to match. In this example, I'm giving you uh, the actual SQL loader information that we use to load all of the extended attributes and uh, extended tag elements into the two tables that we discussed. Um, this is just an example again, um, and we chose to use SQL loader. There are many ways to, to get data into the database tables. Um, I think the important thing here is just to note that the information that you intend to extend must, uh, must exist in those two tables. Okay. Again, once that information is in the tables, you may go back into the ESM mapping tool, and then you should now, on the left-hand side of your new DTD, you should now be able to see the extended element that you have added. And now it just becomes a PLSQL uh, programming method to make sure that you cover all of the import and export uh, capabilities of the um, mapping tool. And uh, many of the times what, what we were able to do is just take a similar element that was already present in the E2B definition copy its import and export code, and make minor manipulations in order to um, maintain the uh, Argus API call integrity uh, so that we were doing things exactly the way that Oracle had prescribed them to be done in the other tags that were similar in this uh, DTD element. When you copy the uh, new profile to create the new DTD element, you do have to make sure that you check mark the extended E2B option here. Otherwise, you won't be allowed to extend any of the elements. So that is something that uh, you want to keep in mind. You can also set up E2B validation rules. So you can modify uh, some of the E2B plus profile uh, import restrictions. Um, you can set up mandatory elements, et cetera. All of this requires some database manipulation and uh, uh, discussion, honestly, with the business community. Uh, and in our case, because this was an automated 
integration, the IT community, to make sure that any mandatory violations that we put in were, were all agreed upon before we uh, invested the time and energy in programming that. Once all of the E2B mapping and elements were in place, then we needed to uh, create reporting destination that would utilize this new extended DTD element, and we needed to define all of the folders on the uh, server directories so that the LSH system could pick up and drop off the uh, appropriate XML file using web services. So in this example, I'm showing you the configured reporting destination. <clears throat> um, again, we just named them arbitrary uh, based on discussions with the end user community and technical teams. And then we went into the testing phase, and this was pretty much an iterative process, and it definitely involved uh, technical people from the user community. Uh, this particular client had uh, really good resources from both the IT perspective and from the user community perspective. People who really knew what they wanted and, and were, were key in, in providing input to us so that we made sure we did the right thing. Um, this did include several cycles of kind of end-to-end -end testing where we would start out with um, uh, information in the source system in various ways and, and formats and, and, and structures, and we would try and, and, and test the system in, in sometimes in extremes to make sure that the end XML file result was appropriate to the, to the business world. One thing that I think we've learned from this large-scale project is that an implementation uh, release phase, uh, kind of a phased approach to roll out, is actually very helpful. And this is what this client is in the process of doing right now. So while the system has been validated and uh, functionally uh, tested, the Sponsored trial data from the various business units are so different from one another that a phased approach to releasing was considered uh, safer, lower risk. So right now, uh, one or two um, teams from the business world have agreed to implement the integration piece and are using it in a production capacity. This really does allow uh, that kind of um, iterative acceptance of the system to, to still occur while giving us the opportunity to see live, real data that sometimes we can't make up in our arbitrary validation or testing space. So it's a really, I think, nice approach of deploying all of the various uh, business owners or, or stakeholders in this type of waived approach will, will probably end up helping uh, everything, user acceptance of the system, et cetera. So that's kind of the overview um, of the project. Some of the slides are quite detailed. I think that um, some of the things will be really helpful to some of you who maybe have not yet played around with the extended E2B elements, the slides really do tell you exactly how to do that. So again, don't forget you're going to get copies of all of this. But I think what, what I argue were some of the more interesting pieces of this project were definitely the, the gotchas, the, the, the challenges that we faced. Um, so first and foremost, I think, was the synchronization of all of the configuration data across these various systems. This is not easy. This is a very uh, challenging aspect of the, the project. Um, we also didn't anticipate when we far, first started doing this work that the E2B tag order would have anything to do with um, the, the information configured in the database table, nor should it match something as seemingly arbitrary as the SQL select order in the export code. 
but in fact what we encountered is that it, it is absolutely crucial. So that order cannot be different. If it is different, then your E2B exports will not work. Um, some other things, the E2B tag names can't exceed 30 characters. Again, not something that was known to us prior to this project. So this um, added to, to our understanding of the ESM module and also ensured that this uh, client created tags that were relatively easy to read. Um, we did, however, know that we could not add new parent tags um, or repeating sections. So these, these are things we anticipated, but this particular one we, we saw manifest in the um, actual implementation of this. So that, that was also an interesting challenge that we faced. Um, some other things, uh, default logic for importing study products. And by this I mean if we configure the study in the XML file to actually be a company study in our study repository, then what ends up happening is when the XML file indicates that this is a product from a clinical trial or a, a sponsored trial configured in Argus, then all of the product information will be created in a single product record. And this is true even if multiple, quote, products of the same product are delivered to the patient. And this is kind of important, um, arguably not for drug companies is this important, but this could have a, a great deal of uh, ramification on uh, device companies where, for example, a, a stent may have extensions attached to it, and that extension's the same product. It's extension, let's just call it extension A, but five of those extensions could be added to the patient. So, uh, or for that matter, you could just have the stent added five times to the patient. So in a device world, we would want to see all five of those uh, stents listed as five products so that we can evaluate all five of those appropriately. Unfortunately, if this came from a sponsored trial that was set up as a clinical trial in Argus, the E2B rules will see that as a single product with essentially five dosings. And that is um, not ideal for many companies. So this is, again, just a limitation of when you are importing the study data into a uh, Argus system that has been configured as a, as a study in your study configuration area. Also, uh, careful consideration of whether or not to uh, enable the auto acceptance of of uh, follow-ups or updates to existing. The business really needs to understand the implications of that. Um, this was a challenge for us as well uh, because of the volume. Uh, it was considered by the business uh, possibly tedious to have to manually accept each update of follow-up coming in from the source system. and. Some in the business view felt it necessary to auto accept updates. And so you just need to work with the business to make sure that they fully understand that decision. Um, this particular client uh, is a device firm, and so there are very much known limitations with device products and how they are imported and exported through the E2B mechanism. Because, again, the E2B standard is not the electronic medical device uh, report standard. The EMDR program uses a different XML standard called HL7. And currently, in the current releases of Argus, we cannot conform to the HL7 format. This will change in the E2B R3 release. Of Argus, the HL7 format will be uh, possible.
All right. So those were some of our key uh, challenges that we faced. Um, again, I, I want to leave some time for some questions here. But that's just a basic overview of this very complicated uh, project that is, is actually still ongoing. Um, as you saw, there's a rollout, a phased rollout approach. Um, so, and I believe we even may have some individuals on the call who could uh, field any specific questions that I'm not capable of answering. So, uh, Eugene, why don't we go ahead and, and look at some of the questions. Great. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to remind everybody that you can ask questions via the chat feature, which is located on the left side of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can in the next 10 minutes or so. And Rodney, you could also follow along on the questions tab. Um, some of these questions may have already been answered, but we'll go ahead and field them. Actually, anyway. Eugene, I'm so sorry. I see them. I can, I can field them. Okay, sure. Not a problem. Thanks. Okay, so how many E2B Plus extended tags did we add? So I, if you couldn't tell from my presentation, I am not the technical lead for this. Um, however, if you give me two seconds, I can uh, ping the person that did do this work and ask him roughly how many we did. Okay. Um, so while we're waiting on that answer, I'll come back to that. I believe that was uh, James that asked that. So I'm sorry, Philippe. So okay. Uh, the next question was, where was the SAE data collected in OCRDC? Was it within the study or outside? Um, if within the study. What was the solution to continue to collect SAE data after the study locked? Okay, so I can probably answer both of those. Um, I assume that what this individual might be referring to is the possibility of OCRDC creating a study that just handles SAE data completely regardless of its study origin as opposed to uh, creating SAE case report forms within an individual OCRDC study. So I can tell you that it is the latter. So if I understood that question correctly, the SAE data was collected within each study. Um, and then the, to the point of what happens if SAE data is collected after study lock, that is an interesting uh, clinical perspective that I don't think we've encountered yet. These are uh, sponsored trials, so there's a, there's a great deal of control of when to lock and when not to. So I think um, I would have to defer to someone else in this room if anyone from that uh, project would like to answer that. We can certainly tell you if we've experienced that yet, but to, to date we have not. So all SAE data has come in during the live study. Nothing has been locked yet. Um, and I do have an answer for you. There are 40 extended E2B elements that we've created for this particular project. Um, I have another question here about the precise number of studies that we've integrated and full duration of the project. Um, yeah, I, I probably would not want to go into full uh, discussion of, of duration. You saw in the slide that I indicated that it has been an ongoing uh, approximate two-year project uh, that is, is still ongoing. The precise number of studies is uh, also something I'm not privy to, but again, the number of studies really doesn't matter as much as you would think because we have insisted on the uh, requirement that all studies be conformed to the SDTM standard. So because of this con the, the, the way in which the studies are being conformed to the SDTM, 
SDTM standard, we, we don't really care if it's one study or 50 studies. They, as long as they all conform to SDTM, the data will be transmitted in the exact same methodology. Um, but right now with the rolling approach, I believe there are only one, uh, two or three maybe uh, studies currently undergoing this type of uh, integration piece. Uh, but again, many are up for grabs on the rolling release of the application. Ah, uh, another good question. Um, if an organization does not have LSH, how can this be achieved? Yeah, very good point. Um, it, it, this, this methodology really doesn't require you to have a data warehousing system. The, the only reason that we uh, utilized LSH here is because this company does have it and did want a central data warehousing repository to do all sorts of very nice dashboards and user-defined reporting outside of either the data management systems or the safety management system. So that for this company is LSH. However, you can take the premise of creating some type of tool to conform your data to a standard, and you can use that premise as a integration method for any source system to, to the Argus safety system using this approach of ESM uh, extension. So again, the LSH is definitely not a requirement here. Um, oh, another typical question, um, was there any need for SAE reconciliation between clinical data and SAE data? So this also came up in the business definition and business uh, discussions. <clears throat> so that was um, something that we, we definitely had to deal with. Um, some, this was a very staunch a difference in philosophy. Some people insisted that a reconciliation would still need to be performed. Other people said no, a reconciliation wouldn't need to be performed because everything is coming from the source and ending up in the target. I think the client landed on a, a happy medium, which was they would do uh, some type of reconciliation reporting, um, mostly because of the, con uh, the, the need to conform the data into SDTM standards. They wanted to make sure that nothing was lost in that, that, that controlled um, manipulation of the information between source and target. Um, sorry, I'm going to go back one slide for the next question. Um, so uh, someone also has asked, could you please explain the last gotcha about follow-up imports? So yes, I can, I can do this. So for example, the source system may have deleted uh, one of the previously um, submitted SAEs, let's say. Argus does not delete or clear out any of the values on the import of follow-up. So we had to handle how we were going to identify nullification records and how that would actually be imported in. And we also needed to figure out how it was that the import was going to handle actual deleted values. So for example, if we started out with three medical histories in the initial <coughs> in the initial creation of the SAE in Argus, how were we going to handle it if the source system on follow-up removed it to two medical records, uh, medical history records? So there are some very clear limitations on the import of follow-up data in, in your E2B bridging. And this is, again, some of the limitations of using the extension of the E2B elements to accomplish this type of, of complex integration versus doing what we would do in the old school model where we would just do a direct database to database integration. So it's just a point of being cognizant of the, the limits of the target system. Um, I'm going to have to jump around on some of these questions. I don't think we are going to have time for all of them. I think we have 10 more questions here. So 
I apologize if I'm not reading your questions. I'm going to have to give everyone a, an equal chance to ask. How do you handle the follow-up on SAE after the initial entry? So I believe what we have done is we have said that certain attributes at the study configuration level will indicate whether or not the uh, follow-up information should be automatically accepted or if the uh, study is one where manual intervention uh, in, the, in the import of the follow-up should occur in Argus. So the users have the ability, the flexibility to choose either options. Um, but currently in the, in the first rollout, I believe that all of the follow-up information is being manually accepted or rejected by the uh, safety specialist during the time of, of import. Um, did you have extension tags in the lab test section? Any issue for the follow-up update of the lab test data? So good question, again, and it's kind of um, implying uh, the same gotcha that, that was addressed in the previous question. So yes, if you have missing information in the lab data or data that has changed over time, the import process becomes uh, very uh, complicated. Um, and, and can can cause issues. So I do not believe we extended any of the tags in the lab test section for this particular project, but you still might have the same problem that I explained with the medical histories. Da, 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 da. Um. Okay, so um, how exactly were the AEs determined as SAE from, from OCRDC? Um, and did the uh, system send any other information over via the web services to further determine if the SAE was based on uh, some type of validation rule set by, and I'm not sure what that acronym TRI is, um, but yes, so the, the trigger in order to send the, the SAE or, or AE over, that it was definitely a study configuration, and the mapping tool allows for that uh, some uh, flexibility in determining how and what information uh, would make it across in the in the bridge uh, based on, on logic within this study. Uh, because as you can imagine, each study was different. Some wanted product complaint information. Some may have wanted AE information. Um, in the medical device world, there were also complexities of um, device failures or potential device failures, and we needed to accommodate those types of, of complexities. And I think I can only take probably one more question. Uh, is the EDC agnostic, i.e., will this work with any EDC like OCRDC, Inform, Metadata, Rave, etc.? So again, <clears throat> the concepts presented in this slide deck should work with any EDC system. The importance here is that your EDC system, regardless of what it is, should conform the information into some type of standard in order for you to plug uh, the ESM extended attribute methodology into, into this type of integration. So I would say and argue, yes, this methodology is agnostic of the EDC system. And, and to further my point, there are two EDC systems presented in this presentation, OLX and OCRDC. This was not an integration of just OCRDC. Um, so Eugene, I think, I think we've ran out of time now. And again, I, I apologize to those of you we didn't get to your questions. We will respond to your questions via email. Great. Thank you, Rodney. Uh, like Rodney said, if you have any other questions, feel free to contact us via phone or email. Uh, you can also reach any of these contacts 
on the slide that's in front of you. Please remember that the webinar recording will be available within 24 hours on biofarm.com. We will email it to you as well as a PDF version of the presentations. If you for some reason do not get it via email, you're welcome to go on the website and retrieve it yourself. Uh, we would also like to invite you to other upcoming webinars that are available on our website. We have numerous safety webinars that are coming up. So please go ahead and register if you wish. And once again, thank you so much for joining us on this presentation. We hope you found it helpful, and we look forward to you joining us in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye.